There we go. Okay. Um, so now we are recording. So with that, uh, let me hand things over. Um, oh, I forgot to mention the last thing, uh, which is uh, the group has 30 minutes of presentation time. And that's the total, the total block. Um, so we asked them to speak for about 20 minutes um, and then use the last couple of minutes for a question and answer. Um, so everyone just keeps track of time. Um, and with that, now let me hand things over um, to, is it, is it pronounced Magna Ray? Is that or Magna Ra? Magna Ra. Magna Ra. Okay. Magna Ra. Sorry about that. Let me hand it over to Magna Ra to present their heliostat. All right. So uh, hello, everyone. This is group 674Y, also known as the Solar Warriors. And uh, we're pleased to present to you the Magna Ra. I'm Braden Shepard. We also have Samuel Applin, Samuel Beck, Anderson Brunsfold, Christina Dorsey, Marvin Portillo, and Kent Snelson. So right off the bat, we wanted to give an outline of what we'll be discussing today. Uh, this is most of, of the key points we'll be touching on, uh, the most significant of which are the test milestones, key design features, design evolution, and the calculations. Before we get deep into the results of our design process, we wanted to share our overarching design goal for this project, as we call it the hedgehog concept, uh, which is that we wanted our design to be as compact as possible without sacrificing on any functionality. We believe this design goal had a huge impact in our final product and really sets us apart from products already on the market and even the other design teams here in EML 4502. So here we're going to get into some key product specifications. Uh, we ended up going with NEMA 17 stepper motors. Uh, these were provided by the UF lab to us. Uh, stepper motors are an excellent selection for heliostats as they make very precise movements and hold position. Though most smaller stepper motors such as NEMA 17s have very low holding torques, the 37 to one worm gear makes our design essentially non-back drivable and thus able to hold position under much heavier loads. The design also features a 360 degree azimuth range of motion and an elevation range of motion of 165 degrees. Though the range of motion is limited in the elevation axis, this does not pose an issue in functionality because the heliostat is not expected to operate in an elevation settings past 90 degrees. The product weighs just over one kilogram and a large percentage of which is due to the stepper motors. Uh, the mirror dimensions give a 0.0225 square meter area of reflectivity. So essentially uh, it would require 45 heliostats to achieve one square meter of reflectivity. So before we get started into the details of the design, we wanted everyone to be on the same page as far as nomenclature. So we'd like to quickly show some of the major parts in our design and describe three of the most significant parts in more detail. First, we'd like to define the support rod as the bar going across the middle connecting the two mirror brackets and is driven by the stops, the top stepper motor. The mounting base is the bottom most part of the design and is designed in such a way as to quickly snap into camera mounting quick connectors. Lastly, the motor mount body is the centerpiece of the design and houses the stepper motors and turns as mythly with respect to the mounting base. All right, so this semester, each team had to perform various milestone tests to demonstrate desired progress on our heliostats. Because we're one of the first teams to present, I will describe both tests for those of you who may not yet be familiar with them. So the first test was a wind survivability test where our heliostat had to prove that it could remain intact under the most extreme weather conditions of Las Vegas. In normal operation mode, the mirror was in a vertical position. The heliostat was locked down with a quick release plate in a wind tunnel and had to survive 15 full rotations on its turntable while being blown by air traveling at 4.1 and then 5.3 meters per second. 
In safety mode configuration, the mirror was in a horizontal position to simulate how it would behave in extreme weather conditions, such as a tornado or severe rainstorm. In this configuration, the heliostat had to withstand air traveling at 60 meters per second for 15 full rotations on the turntable. On our first attempt, our heliostat demonstrated that it could perform in these conditions without any catastrophic failure. One fault, however, which may be visible from the video, was that our mirror was close to detaching from the back plate. However, this could be explained by how this was our first um, iteration of the design, and we calculated the tolerances on the back plate incorrectly, so the mirror was two millimeters too wide and therefore did not snugly fit against the back plate. In the laser reflection targeting test, our heliostat was to demonstrate that it could reflect sunlight to a central concentration tower with desired accuracy. In this test, a laser positioned directly above the heliostat was used to place sunlight, and wall targets replaced a central targeting tower. The full configuration can be seen in the video in the center of the page. During our test, our heliostat hit every target within the blue ring. While our performance was not ideal during the test, we remained confident in its accuracy because before the test, with having had more time for calibration, we managed to hit two targets within the yellow circle and two within the red circle. We are sure that with more static conditions, such as an immovable table mount and stronger laser scaffold, we could achieve less than 0.5 degree accuracy. Now we will describe some of our key design features. We'll start with our 3D printed mirror back plate. We opted against printing a solid plate for various reasons. First, we wanted to avoid it from peeling up from the build plate, which would firstly be unusable, but would also um, unnecessarily waste money on filament. Next, with our honeycomb pattern, we decreased the weight, cost, and manufacturing time of the back plate. With a piece that is approximately 150 by 150 by 10 millimeters, the cutouts reduced the volume by 1.49 cubic inches. Next, we implemented slide mounts on the back side for easy attachment of our mirror supports and eliminated the need for fasteners by having a close fit. Lastly, by having a lip along two sides of the back plate, our heliostat will not rely on the adhesive backing of the mirror to survive in Las Vegas for 20 years. Our next key design feature was the motor mount body. Two of the NEMA 17 stepper motors are fastened to this motor mount body and the motor mount body moves as mistily with the assembly. So this motor mount body greatly allowed us to reduce the overall uh, height of our assembly compared to earlier designs. Uh, because both NEMA 17 motors were affixed to this, we were allowed, or we're more easily capable of reducing the height. So when designing this component, we made sure that uh, the entire motor mount body had smooth curves to improve the 3D printability of the design, as well as reducing the amount of uh, support structure that was required. You can also see on the top of the motor mount body, there's a cap. So the motor mount body is actually two parts and this cap allows us to uh, reduce the environmental degradation caused by possible sand that would enter the assembly if we didn't have this cap otherwise. So the next component is the mounting base. So the mounting base actually has the uh, camera mount feature 3D printed or uh, added onto this component. So this greatly reduce or re increases the stability of our design, which is one of the main things we're looking for during the wind survivability test. It also has a hollow feature that allows the wiring to travel down the inside of the assembly and exit at the bottom of our assembly to uh, easily access the ESP32 and motor controllers. Uh, and that's it for this feature, our design feature. So the next key design feature is our gear train. So our gear train actually utilizes a 3D printed worm gear. The 3D printed worm gear greatly reduced the cost of the worm gear from nearly $40 per worm gear down to less than $1 per worm gear. We still utilize a metal worm that we uh, got from McMaster car, but we conducted a 20 year lifetime test, which included running the 
our worm gear drivetrain for nearly an hour and a half at a high rate of speed to simulate the amount of movement that would be required in 20 years of operation. And we noticed no significant uh, reduction in or increase in backlash or reduction in capability of our design. With the 37 to 1 gear reduction of the gear train, uh, we're able to get uh, just under 0 0.05 degrees of accuracy, which is something far in excess of the capabilities that were required. And the next slide just goes over just the quick uh, calculations. So if we have 200 steps per rotation of the step promoter, and a 37 to 1 gear reduction, and assuming 365 or 360 degrees per uh, rotation of the heliostat, we get to uh, 0 0.0486 degrees per step of the step promoter. So here's uh, the original design that we started with at the beginning of the semester. <clears throat> the heliostat design was quite tall, so stronger winds would cause a larger bending moment at the base of the support. Because of this, the main support pole had to be made of aluminum. The motor box that was included to avoid weather damage was also quite big and had a lot of unused space. Only one motor and a pair of gears were placed in the box. The mirror bracket was just kind of attached to the support rod, leaving fastening up in the air. Plus, welding or using an adhesive to fasten the mirror bracket are not the greatest options. The design also did not have many 3D printed parts, most likely due to the large forces that the system will take on due to its size. This in turn raised the cost of the system and dampened the ease of manufacturing. Next slide, please. With our new design, we opted to keep the centralized gear and motor system. We used worm gears to ensure accuracy and to try and eliminate any back drive. The gear system is enclosed within, within the support structure and is weatherproof with a covering. The system stands less than 0.2 meters tall, which drastically reduces the forces that it would experience due to wind. The center of gravity is very low to the ground, which helps with balance and any wind force. The system is entirely 3D printed except for the mirror, the motors, the fasteners, the worm gears, and the sleeve bearings. The worm wheels themselves are 3D printed as well. Because the system is 3D printed, the assembly process is far simpler than our previous design. The only tool needed to assemble our heliostat is an Allen key and a pair of hands. The entire electronic system is stored in a separate weatherproof container, and this allows for multiple heliostats to be controlled from one box. We believe that our current design would outperform our old design due to its low center of gravity, ease of manufacturing, and its much lower cost. Our group performed some preliminary wind speed calculations to determine if the design's structural integrity would hold up in the wind survivability test. Specifically, we investigated if the motor holding torque would be adequate for the moments caused by lift and drag forces. By considering our mirror as a symmetrical flat plate, we used thin airfoil theory to determine the lift and drag forces acting on the plate at an angle of attack of 10 degrees. A 10 degree angle of attack was of particular interest since thin airfoil theory considers a linear relationship between coefficient of lift and angle of attack up to the stall angle at about 10 degrees. Although the magnitude of drag would be highest for the vertical configuration, the heliostat cannot redirect sunlight to an elevated target at 90 degrees. Taking the moments due to lift and drag forces at the quarter cord and setting them equal to the output torque gives us an expression for maximum wind speeds. We use the quarter cord location such that we can take moments about the aerodynamic center. The lift and drag forces were determined by the product of half the dynamic pressure and area scaled by their respective coefficient. The output torque was determined using the holding torque of the motors, 0.59 Newton meter, and our 37 to one worm worm gear ratio. We concluded our motors would be operational for a wind speed up to 344 miles per hour. In our old design, we used a four to one gear ratio, which yielded a much lower output torque than that of the 37 to one gear ratio. In doing so, we were able to consider the maximum speeds of about 90 miles per hour in Nevada. We wanted to note though, that we did not tailor the, the design for such high speeds. It just so happens that our worm worm gear ratio is relatively high compared to our previous design. We also wanted to consider the deflection of the mirror tips under extreme wind loading conditions, 
from determination of the second moment of area and the wind loading, we determined that a maximum deflection of about 1.09 millimeters would be experienced by the mirror tips. All right, next up, we have some exploder views of our assembly. Uh, we created some GIFs to depict how you would go about disassembling our heliostat. So our heliostat can be separated into four parts initially. The lower body can be pulled out of the main body and the back plate can slide out of those mirror supports as previously mentioned, at which point the mirror can also be slid off of the back plate. And all of this can be done by hand because there are no tools necessary at this stage. Now, taking a closer look at the main body, the first thing we would do is slide off both of those mirror supports from that central rod. Then we could snap off the top cover from the main body, which would allow access to the internal components. Um, at this point, we could begin this assembly of the elevation motor. So first, you would unscrew the motor using an Allen key. Um, and then you could take the worm off of the motor shaft and finally pull the motor itself out. After this, we could begin this assembly of the center rod and the elevation worm gear. Uh, we would unscrew two screws, which are holding the worm gear in place, and then take out the respective nuts as well. Then we could pry out our Teflon sleeve bearings and slide out the rod itself. Um, next, we disassemble the azimuth motor. Two of the screws holding it in place uh, need to be are accessed from the outside, but one of them needs to be unscrewed from the inside of the body, which is why we need to slide out that lower portion and take out the central rod and worm gear first in order to have access to that. Finally, the last thing to do for this portion is to take out the limit switches. For the lower portion, it is very straightforward. It consists of three parts, the azimuth worm gear, the Teflon bearing allowing rotation about the azimuth, and the mounting base. All these parts can just slide off one another, again, be pulled apart by hand. And the only thing not depicted in this disassembly is the wiring, so I could briefly talk about that. The wires will enter through a hole through the mounting base, and then they could go through the center of the hole in the um, azimuth worm gear. The wires can then run along the inside of the body, uh, to connect to both motors as well as the limit switches. And it's important to note that there's no interference with any moving parts, even after 360 degree rotation. The total cost of our uh, prototype was $187.83, $20.60 of which was spent on 3D printed materials and $49.90 uh, of which was spent on bushings, bearings, and limit switches. The rest of the total cost is made up of lab provided parts such as the ESP32, um, the rover board, motor controllers, and the stepper motors. A single type uh, prototype material total was 187 and 83 cents as seen before. The manufacturing costs or 54 cents for energy and 53 cents for assembly labor, which were calculated using a um, labor chart and the minimum, uh, the average wage for, un for skilled labor in Nevada, resulting in a total cost per module of $188.90 due to the law of mass production parts were made uh, cheaper by ordering in bulk, uh, reducing the cost by $15 to um, $173.63 um, when parts such as the spiral gears and the uh, limit switches were ordered in bulk. Magna Ross should be chosen for further product development due to its compact size, lower center of gravity, ease of assembly, minimized tracking error, and resistance to high wind speeds. Leading today's market in size, cost, and simplicity, the Magna Ra is guaranteed to fulfill your industrial solar processing needs. We would like to thank the Merge Lab, Northrop Grumman, Cummins, Carrier, and Arigo for their support of this project. Any questions? I guess this is Tom Singer uh, from North Grumman. Can I ask, uh, is this exact thing what you're anticipating selling to a customer to install and generate power? 
Yes, it is. We do have some ideas for um, changes such as um, for the mirrored back plate, uh, we were thinking about offering some clips to have on the top and bottom of the back plate to further secure the mirror to the back plate. Um, however, generally, yes, this is the design we would sell. Including the size of the mirror? Um, we can always change the scale of the design. Um, however, the size of the mirror was just what was offered to us by the lab this semester. So we yeah, um, no, I'd, formulated... I'd... I, I kind of gathered that from from previous uh, uh, reviews that that you know the lab kind of provided you a number of parts and uh, you know in, in large part that was driving your your overall cost because uh, you know it was fixed. But um, as I recall from the customer needs statement, they were looking for a like a reflecting area of like a meter squared or, or something on on that scale, right? And and your mirror is substantially smaller, right? Correct. So are you, are you anticipating providing one of these systems to move a whole bunch of tiny mirrors, or are you anticipating having, uh, you know, one larger mirror mounted on uh, on this uh, actuation system? Um, I believe that if the customer wanted a full one meter squared reflected area, um, we would probably want to change the design. Um, I do believe that that customer need was more specific to our previous course, Mechanical Design 2. Um, and this semester um, for this course, that customer need was, um, didn't seem very um, necessary, uh, just from what we gathered from uh, Dr. Trong's um, documents okay, that the, he provided. The reason I ask is because is I'm, I'm trying to get it at what your goals are with with the specific thing that you built, right? And it it seems to me that the goals are basically to prototype the mechanism. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Yes. Okay. So so in prototyping the mechanism, making sure that it it you know is able to move and able to point where you want it to point. Um, but then we've got a bunch of statements like, hey, our our structure has a low center of gravity, it's low to the ground, so we're minimizing like, you know, the bending moment at the base, right? Well, that's that's true with your tiny mirror, but when you have a bigger mirror, you're gonna have to elevate this somewhat, right? And and you're talking about, um, you know, hey, we can withstand a, a Cat 8 hurricane or, or an F3000 tornado, right? With, with super high wind speeds. Um, but that's, again, driven by this fact that you've got this super tiny mirror that's probably going to be significantly bigger right so so all of the uh like the the load analysis that you did while, while i appreciate it and I, I certainly appreciate that you had some hand calcs on on you know deflection in your mirror um that's not really representative of what i understand the final product is going to be so I'm, I'm not real sure what that added um some some other sorts of things i i appreciate that, that you're thinking about the life of your system and and like that you said hey we we ran our uh, our actuation system for like an hour and a half at high speed which will you know cover however long it'll actually be running um a couple of concerns with that are i i'm pretty sure you ran that without anything to simulate load and i'm also pretty sure that you know in addition to just the sort of steady state operation the starting and stopping is is potentially going to uh, cause more wear than than just that steady state uh, operation. Uh, and then I'll, I'll ask because I've, I've kind of asked the other groups this: um, what what are you showing with your wind test? Like what was what was your structure? Uh, you know, did you have the motors in there and and you know have them try to actuate, or are you just showing? Hey, this is what our our system looks when you put it in a uh, a wind tunnel. Yeah, so for the wind test, we didn't, uh, we were not to do any sort of actuating. Um, we had the system in there and we had it at a certain um, elevation angle. Like right here, there was a safety test where um, when, uh, when high, high speed winds were expected, um, the heliostat would go to a safety mode, which you can see here is, is, is perfectly horizontal. Um, and so mm -hmm. this was one of the tests. Um, another one of the tests was also having it uh, vertical, but at lower speeds. Um, to, just to see how much it, it could handle with, with the full force of drag. 
Um, we were not, uh, we have the motors in there and it is spinning. So as you can see in the video, so it is, it is simulating the azimuth uh, rotation, but our motors are not doing that. Okay. And I do want to touch real quick on the fact that um, the reason our design is so compact is because one of the uh, main customer needs as well is to capitalize on a small scale heliostat. Um, we can scale it and we definitely would, but like you said, it would be a lot different. The whole design would change. It was supposed to be a small scale heliostat. And so we wanted to um, capitalize on the fact that it is that small. Okay. Well, how, how small is effective for your customer, right? If, if you've got this much, right, your, your reflecting area is something like an eighth of a square meter in that ballpark. That's correct. Right. Yeah. So, so when your customer installs this to actually generate power, right, they wanted to generate like a megawatt of power. So how many of these are they going to have to install at this scale versus scaling things up? Right. So, so you can look right. at the individual cost of, of, you know, this one compact module versus you know, the cost of actually doing what they want to do, which is ultimately generate power. Um, so I, I think that uh, if, if the scale of your prototype is significantly going to impact the design of the prototype, then I, I'm not sure that the prototype really demonstrates uh, the capability that, uh, that you're hoping to demonstrate. Yeah, I, I understand that. And like, and like we said earlier, it would take about 45 of them to get to that one meter squared. And I think there is a sweet spot to be found between the size of the system and like generating that one megawatt. I understand what you mean. Um, additionally, the mirror is, uh, the strength of the system is predicated on the strength of the arms going to the mirror not so much the gears because it, they are worm gears and non-back drivable. Um, as long as the, the gears within the system were withstanding the force, then the main point of where, uh, where it would break would be the arms connecting the mirror to the rotational shaft. So if we did scale up the mirror, we would most likely just have to increase the thickness or change the material of the arms and the camshaft to ensure that they did not break um, relative to everything else. So also to touch on the, the lifetime test, the lifetime test was uh, a simple 180 degree movement of the elevation uh, okay. portion of our assembly. So it did take into account starting and stopping uh, for the lifetime. Although with a larger mirror, we'd account larger load forces when compared to our current mirror assembly. Uh, we do think it was a good uh, method for the current assembly. Okay, um, <clears throat> any more questions from our panel? nothing here okay cool well actually that's good because looking at the time we're we're a minute or two over so it's probably a good time to stop um so let me stop the recording